Welcome, welcome. This is Leaf Style, where education, culture, and cannabis collides. I'm Juma, and my co-host this season, medical cannabis and emergency medical physician, the founder of Ask Dr. Lin, Dr. Safia Lin. What's thank up, you, Doc? Thank hey. you, thank you, hey. <laughs> Thank you, Juma, our resident attorney, sociologist, and all-around global citizen. Such a pleasure to share this platform with you and introduce our guest of the day, Mr. Rich Medina. Thank you so much for coming on, our DJ, platinum-selling producer, Ivy League graduate and professor at Lincoln and Cornell, journalist, poet, spoken word artist, and most recently, music director of Dante's Hi-Fi. Did I leave anything out? um yes as a matter of fact um, please pra tell us praise god as of august of this year i am part of the pew center for humanity and arts 2021 wow. pew grant recipients wow so announcement a, you heard it first became a fellow this year that's what's up tell us a little that's more about up. that uh, since 2005, the Pew Center for Humanities and Arts gives out a series of artist grants to Philadelphia mm -hmm. artists that they believe they believe that your work has moved the needle. And um, over the last five or six years, I believe, they've been in a nomination process. So I was one of, I believe it was 85 people nominated to apply. Uh, 85 get nominated and 12 win and i wow. was one of the winners of the 2021 pew fellowship congratulations wow. congratulations Big congrats. that's beautiful Big congrats. thank you very much for, for artists who've moved the needle no pun intended yeah yeah well i mean it kind of accidental <laughs> pun and we already got big puns so that's a small pun <laughs> I... <laughs> yes sir yes sir so let's get into it yeah man when did your relationship with cannabis start man i am a kid from lakewood new jersey i grew up in the 70s in jersey in the hood and adjacent to the middle class. Cannabis has always been in my life. Mm. I've seen men of my family and of my neighborhood utilize cannabis for various reasons from their earliest years that I can remember. The smell, the atmosphere, the energy around it, the, the communal energy around having it, I remember it from childhood deep childhood, my first experience of uh, the benefits of cannabis personally came at 14. I'm 51 today. So I'm right. Smokey Robinson for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's a good thing or not. I don't know if I've done too much information for it. <laughs> That's a great Doc. thing. <laughs> <laughs> right. So talk a little bit about that. Growing up in Lakewood, New Jersey, mm. playing ball. Which came first, the love for the music or the love for the basketball? Uh, music. Music was most definitely music. first. I grew up in a, in a Baptist church family. I grew up with my mother. Uh, my mother's father was the deacon of First Union Baptist Church on Heck Avenue in Neptune, New Jersey. All of his brothers are men of the cloth. I didn't grow up with my father's side of the family, but all my father's brothers and all the elder men of my father's side of the family uh, are men of the cloth. And whether you're Church of God in Christ or Baptist, uh, the black church, our worship is led by music so i fell into that um athletics and things like that didn't really come into play until 
middle school, really, you know. When you were younger, did you sing or play or what was your participation in the church? All of it. Sang. All of it. Choir. Uh, you know, my grandmother was choir director. All right. the instruments of the band were in my grandparents' garage. I was busting right. snare drum heads and snapping guitar strings all week. Like, it was going out of style, you know? <laughs> Typical spoiled kid, right? You give a kid too much of something, all you got to do is break it. You know, we got the whole back line of the damn church, you know, in my grandparents' house. So I'm just touching stuff and messing with stuff all week. So, unnecessarily. You know, <laughs> unnecessarily. Uh, um, mm -hmm. Unnecessarily, necessarily, so many yeah. facets in that diamond, you know what I mean? It piqued so your many... curiosity from a young age. Absolutely, absolutely. And yeah. I, I'll call it a diamond because of where I am now in my life with regard to music. So, you know, I have to argue with myself, you know, was that just a kid being an unnecessarily newsy and messing mm -hmm. with stuff they shouldn't be messing with? Was it? Mm -hmm. this, is, this is who I am now. This is the fabric of my game. So right. I go back and forth was, with myself with that exact debate a lot. It was probably the catalyst right. to what made you the dynamic producer you are now. Without a doubt. I mean, you know, there's no expression like the expression of a brown person singing in a church. Right. <laughs> uh, it's the bellwether for what goes on in pop music as we know it. And all secular music is derived from the beauty of Negro spirituals and hymns mm. and praise singing. So I take that, I take that vocabulary extremely seriously. I believe mm. in that connection mm. 100%. All right, absolutely. So speaking of that, you're doing everything in the church, you're around music at that early time. When did you say, hey, Maybe DJing will be my my vehicle for my love of music. Um, so you can imagine growing up in the 70s, 40 minutes south of Manhattan. We had our own Cool Herks. We had our own Grandmaster Flash. We had our own Grand Wizard Theodore. We had our own mm -hmm. Pete DJ Flowers, Hollywood. You could go on and on and on. Disco Twins, all the all the pioneering New York DJs that are well noted as catalysts for culture. You know, the culture is something that was alive and well up and down the entire Eastern Seaboard. There was we there was windmills and head spins and gangs and b boys and b girls and graffiti and DJing and MCing in my neighborhood at the same time that all of that was happening. I mean, you know, New York is New York. New York is to music what Hollywood is to film, to be fair. But, yeah, you know, we were, we were just adjacent enough that that fallout was, was damn near simultaneous, you know. So I was buying records in the store before Rapper's Delight came out. I was buying records in the store before Rapture made rap good viable to white people uh mm. yeah i'm not romantic about hip-hop i'm a lifelong b-boy uh, i'm a member of rocksteady crew an active member of rocksteady crew an active member of universal zulu nation so it's not it's not a game for me it's not it's not romance or theory right i love it active you, you made that very clear. It's active, yeah, you know? <laughs> for sure. I think, I think that the, the way the world is set up today, there's a great deal of headroom for lip service. Yeah. You can pose yeah. and, and stunt your way into opportunity in a way where maybe during our childhoods, whether that's the 70s, 80s, or 90s, there was a little bit of a gauntlet you had to go through, you know? Right, right. Like when I'm teaching DJ classes and kids are asking me about music i'm like you know you got to ask me that question a little bit more pointed because my relationship with attaining music is totally different than yours at mm -hmm. your age when i was your age i had to save some allowance money catch the right bus on the right day hope 
the record's not sold out or the cassette's not sold out or the eight track is not sold out, depending on what's available, then get home and hope that my mom's, her friends, or my older sister and her friends didn't have the stereo hogged up or I might get that piece of music on a Monday and not be able to hear it in the comfort of my own home or at the pace that I want to hear it or at the volume that I want to hear it for another three or four days depending on the variables in play. So ask me that question again. You know, like that's my (laughs) my way with students because, you know, with a student these days, their entire relationship with the universe is here. Immediate. I got 10,000 songs. I got 10,000 friends. I got 50,000 comments, 50,000 statements I've made in the world that tell the world who I am. Their whole galaxy is here. There's no analog sense of urgency so it's very disposable and it's very important to me to draw the line between disposable art and non-disposable art and music has helped me do that very heavily is that when you started your record collection Hmm? is that when you started your record collection yeah you know i got a a sister that's older than me and she was pretty hip my sister's 18 (laughs) years older than me she was pretty hip in her day and, you know, in my grandparents' house, my grandparents' idea of secular music was Al Green, mm-hmm. Aretha Franklin, you know, five blind boys because they made a record, you know, or I don't know. You could go on and on and on with the, with the Clark sisters and mm. gospel artists that had, Luz Vandros, gospel artists that had accidental crossover into the secular world and then here comes my sister with this new age thing that they got going on so my sister was in the gallery and in the garage in the loft i got to inherit all of that vocabulary you know firsthand shout out to the big sis yeah (laughs) the cool big sis yeah for real coolest you know, there's something you were you you mentioned on that. You know, I think we all sort of struggle with and and think about. I I would say, and that is sort of the change of the guard, the technology, the way you initially consume music, and how you speak to your students now. Do you do you see the the way you consume music as being the 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 purest form or do you have space also for what these young kids are now experiencing in sense that it's just going to be totally different and just a new direction how do you balance that uh especially that you teach and, and are around so many young children i mean not children but you know what i mean young people i think that the, i think that the duty of a good student is to remember that they were once a beginning student too and to continue to learn So just because I've been in the game longer than you doesn't mean that there's not something you can teach me. I think that a big caveat in the discussion between generations, particularly us brown folks talking about music, is condescension. I think that many of us who are longer in the tooth speak Mm -hmm. to the youth with a snarkiness and a condescension that would make anyone say, well, I don't want to hear that shit. No wonder his disposition is fucked up when you talking to him. Because look at how you approach the dialogue. You ain't a drill sergeant. This ain't the military. That's not your child. And they didn't do anything wrong. Their lack of experience or their lack of worldview does not make them at fault. It makes them green. So I think that there's a better approach. And I think that there would be less resistance from the youth of the day. My mom didn't like rap music either. But she took the time to ask me why I like it. What are they talking about? What is it that draws me to it? And then she could hold her breath for a whole song and hear a whole, hear Tila Rock is yours front to back and say, oh, 
This guy's actually talking about how clever he is with words and how much he loves to present words to people to make them feel better. Huh. I couldn't decipher that <laughs> because the drums are noisy and the music isn't that musical. Is it a band? Is it a drum program? What is that? How do I, you know, and that gave me an avenue to explain what I like. And now, to this day, my mother's like, you hear the, <laughs> my mom's 88. She's like, you hear the new Common record? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but because she opened the door, right? And from coming from men of the cloth and women of the cloth who take the obligation of sending you home better than you were when you came in here very seriously, I was blessed with that. And now I'm able to pass it forward. The responsibility that you speak of when you talk about your relationship and acknowledgement of how much you can teach and learn at the same time with your students is, is really profound because a lot of people don't see that viewpoint. They do yeah. look at younger age groups as being, you know, resistant to learning about the history. Of course they and are. More They're so. no more resistant than you were, though. Exactly. We all have you know? been in that position. All of us. Exactly. It just exactly. depends on the things that you gravitate to or the things that gravitate to you as you're displaying mm -hmm. that resistance that will agitate mm -hmm. buttons in you that create growth and create maturity and right. make you start looking at tomorrow with different eyes. Make you start looking at things that you did yesterday that you thought were great and realize that it was, you, you kind of phoned that in. That was a lucky A. Like just because you got an A don't mean you worked hard. <laughs> Everybody's exactly. got a puncher's chance, right? Everybody's got an exactly. X on their chin. Everybody's got a puncher's chance. So it's that, that ebb and flow of right and wrong and up and down and yes and no that I believe you have to ride that, that bell curve at all times, particularly people like us, you know, people in the public forum. And you have a platform where you, you have this opportunity to present information. And as you guys know, it's, it's garbage in, garbage out. Putting garbage in. You're going to get garbage back. Right. Talk to kids fucked up. They're going to talk to you fucked up. Talk to them with respect. It might take you a second longer, but if you're as mature as you claim to be, the proverbial you, your patience will shine through, and that kid's going to come around. Yeah. And I think the key part there is, like you mentioned previously, is just take a minute, pause, and remember you were once a child at one time as well and we know how that goes right absolutely um, i was a rookie at one point you know there was a time i didn't know how to shoot a jump shot i didn't know how to defend myself in the paint i didn't know how to defend myself in the street i didn't know how to defend myself in a debate that's learned yeah. and you learn these things by getting your ass kicked in them and recognizing that anything worth having is going to take a sweat it's going to take some pain it's going to take some discomfort Right, right. Absolutely. So, so talking about this, as we think of cannabis, right, I, I put cannabis in the, the holy trinity, right, the synergy. It's food, sex, music. Talk to us a little bit about how cannabis has informed your life around music. Man. How has cannabis <laughs> informed my life around music? <laughs> well, I guess I could start by saying that I'm the type of person that, depending on the cannabis in question, is going to dictate my disposition. Um, I have a tendency to be very kinetic when I'm dealing with the flowers. And kinetic meaning... I could have a smoke and clean up my studio in 30 minutes and file and collate the records that I played from the last five shows in another hour. So I don't know if it necessarily informs me about music, but it turns the white noise down. It makes the other shiny objects dull. I'm able to get quiet and get small and let 
what's going on around me sonically dictate my disposition and guide my decisions about where I'm going to go next musically or what I'm going to do next creatively or what I'm going to wear tomorrow since I wore this today. Mm. Turns the white noise down. Do you like to DJ consuming cannabis? Is that... I like to do everything consuming. <laughs> Agreed. Agreed. Literally. Say it again. Literally. Everything. <laughs> yeah. No hyperbole. Or no hyperbole. I love it. I love it. Um, but yeah, so let's talk to us a little bit about your transition. You're, you're leaving school. You're, you're playing ball. What's up with this semi-pro league? I wanted to circle back to that. I told you I'm, I'm, a, I'm a basketball head. And when I saw that, I'm like, where, where, where? <laughs> yeah. um, I got out of high school in 88. Mm. I went to Lakewood High School, Lakewood, New Jersey. I graduated high school on a Tuesday. By Friday, I was on campus at Cornell because crack era. Don't even got to get into that. My mom's got me the fuck out of there. Mm. Fast forward yeah. four years later, 92, I'm graduating from Cornell. I had 11 job offers, which was amazing. And mm -hmm. I turned them all down to go to a WBO open camp, World Basketball Organization camp. I don't even know if the World Basketball Organization was an organization. I might have just <laughs> Some dudes that got together and called themselves that shit. But anyway, yeah, yeah. it was a it was a semi pro tryout, and it was a tryout in what is now the dinosaur of what we now know as the G League or the D League, which was the Continental Basketball Association and the United States Basketball League. Yep. I ended up making the taxi squad on a team called the New Jersey Jammers. Mm. The tryouts were held in my high school. My high school was a basketball factory. As a matter of fact, mm. J.R. Smith went to my high school. Oh. J.R. Smith's oh. father and uncles used to punish us in the Lakewood Men's Summer League every summer. That's why I can get to the basket with a particular kind of disposition. It's because of J.R. Smith's uncles and his father mm. and a gentleman mm. by the name of Pat Richardson. God bless Pat Richardson. I went to the tryout. The team that I made, my high school coach's high school coach, Bob Nastis, was the head coach. My high school coach, Pat Richardson, was Bob Nastis' assistant. Three other guys from my high school also made that same team. Some of them went on to professional acclaim overseas and a couple of short contracts in the league. Right. So right. I played a very mediocre season of semi-pro ball for <laughs> the New Jersey Jammers. Nice, nice. Was, same, uh, high, hmm? same high school as J.R. Smith, huh? Yeah. That's what's well, up. that's before yeah, he went yeah. to St. Benedict's and all that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, okay. Yeah, I played my yeah. season. I was probably, realistically, I was about four years away from the league, you know? I was mm. one of those guys. Mm. I wasn't going to mm. go straight to the league. I was going to have to put mm. four more years in. I was going to have to put on some weight, develop certain components of my game. You know, as a ball guy, you know that the absolute deepest bench warmer in the NBA is 75 times the athlete right. that his critic is. <laughs> right, 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 so, right, right. You know the caliber of gorilla you're dealing with out there in that space if you've been yeah. in that space it's just a different caliber of athlete it's just something that's very difficult to describe to people that haven't been at those tiers of yeah. professional sports yeah. it's hunger yeah. and uh, yeah. yeah hunger god-given yeah. talent and hard work yep those three yeah. things together is where greatness is born and a lot of people don't notice the hard work they want to give it up and oh he's tall he's this he's that but nah nah yeah. Anybody at that level is putting in incredible amount of work, incredible amount of discipline, yeah. you know. So yeah. salute to you for even that. That's that's a, a, a 
That would be a dream of mine checked off. <laughs> it was. It was, yeah. I, you know, I could have... If I chose to continue to pursue basketball, there's a good chance I might not have met you. I was a goddamn good athlete. I'm a good athlete right the fuck now with a joint hanging out my mouth at my age. Whatever. You know? I love it. Oh, shit. So, but I say that for context because it's very true. It's very factual. It's not me feeling myself. It's a fact. I've seen the echelon. I know what it smells like. And I know that had I made that decision. Right. I would have succeeded because right. I, I don't phone it in. Right. But at the end of that first season, had a shoulder injury, blew my rotator cuff. That was going to add six months to a year to this trajectory, this potential trajectory of playing in the league. And all of my mentors were in my ear the whole time. Like, can't run and jump your whole life, Rich, you know? Black man with an Ivy League degree is loaded gun in the business world. <laughs> Word. You think you we think you're really you're a really talented athlete, but we actually think you're a brighter intellect. You know, these type of things that these men were saying to me. Right. And five of those eleven job offers reopened thanks to Pot Richardson, my college coach, who you may have heard of, a gentleman by the name of Jan Van Bredikoff. Mm. used to play for the Nets, mm. mega star for mm. the Nets, wild wow, ratchet, 6'9", mm. ratchet from half court, like, it's dis disrespectful. Right. Coach, wow. Coach VBK, Coach Richardson, Joel Cowett, Mike Rush, all the men that gathered around my mother when I was coming up, all got together and put those calls in on my behalf five of those offers reopened one of them was with Procter and Gamble in Philadelphia mm -hmm. that's how mm -hmm. I ended up in Philadelphia and that was the beginning of Philadelphia becoming a home for you 92 yes and, and speaking about the sports a little bit more I want to talk you talk about the injuries and things mm -hmm. how have you used cannabis and have you done this consciously to sort of treat some of these I'm sure you got some nagging pains and things like that if you're still playing ball and, and surgeries and such. How have you used cannabis to, to, to assist in that? I firmly believe that due to cannabis and my relationship with cannabis, I have far less aches and pains at my age than many do. Uh, I don't prescribe to full Rasta doctrine, but I do believe in the medicinal vocabulary and Rasta doctrine. That has always been, hey man, everything's ivory. Right. right. Just that, just that statement alone, I think it's something that cannabis does. I think that's why that language is so out front in Rasta culture, is because it is a, it's not a sedative. It, I, I said it earlier, it turns the white noise down. I don't Helps know you another. Focus. Focus. There, yeah, there you yeah. go. There's a, that's the proper, intelligent way to say it. <laughs> <laughs> it gives you focus if you if you let it. Yeah. If, if you, you let, let it. it, and if you're dealing with it with intent, to your to your question, I deal leaning with leaning into with it. You I've lean into the, the process. Absolutely. Yeah. You can tell not how like, you speak. I'm going to smoke a joint, and I'm going to treat my headache with my like. It's not that. No. It's <laughs> Man, let me just have a smoke. Let me take five minutes. Right. And two drags in to that. The thing that was stressed you out three and a half minutes ago. Now it's just a gnat. It looked like a Mack truck. Yeah. <laughs> An hour ago. Now it's just like, meow, meow, meow. <laughs> you know, there's, there's a big difference between those two things coming at you. And... Cannabis has always done that for me in a way that I've been able to recognize. I guess is the best way I can answer that. I love how you speak about the energy that you have surrounding your use because everything is about intention. Everything is about your desire for this goal. 
when you're using it recreationally, people feel like I have to finish this entire joint. But that's not really the objective when smoking, of smoking, whether you're inhaling vape or doing edibles or doing actual flour, when you're consuming the plant, if your intention is to ease some of the noise or ease some of the pain, you smoke to that point and then you take a break. You don't feel or that urgency to complete. Or you continue smoking and get active. One of the two, <laughs> like how you say right? it, you helps you to, it helps you to it's motivate. A, it's a bell curve. It's a bell yep. curve, right? It's, I, to me, it's a dimmer. Mm -hmm. I'm up and down that bell curve every experience. Yeah. Every experience. I'm all through the bell curve, the entirety <laughs> of the bell curve. I'm up and I'm kinetic. I'm, I'm contemplative. I could be gregarious. I could shut the fuck up the whole time. But either way, it's okay because the intent is this communal, especially if I'm in a right. in company. Right. Right. That's what the nature of tribal debate and bread breaking is about. Mm -hmm. It's to be in that tribal moment and have that experience and share those flash bulbs of moments that happen. I mean, we've we've been in the same room at parties. Yes, we you have. You know those moments. You know exactly know. what that moment is. It's a 10 second it, it, it's, I tell people all the time, this is probably a good version of what someone who does crack feels like the first time they do it. Oh, that's, that's why that's they're a, chasing that's... a dragon. <laughs> that's why they're chasing the dragon, because you never get that utopia again. Yep. You and you often that, say that. that. You say that when you spin. You said, sit in the moment. Enjoy this moment. It will never happen again. You say that so often. Oh. This will never happen again. And it helps people to be present. And the people who aren't present will weed themselves out. It's not about getting rid of them. It's about providing them with the opportunity to make an intellectual decision about the space that they're in versus where they thought they were. Mm. I love so that. So it's okay if they exit door left. Yep. It's an ocean, man. Yeah. There's high tide and there's low tide. If I clear the dance floor and they're throwing tomatoes and they're throwing eggs at me, that's the thing. If I clear the dance floor and that guy gets to finally have the conversation with the girl or you get to go to the bathroom as fast as you can because you want to dance some more or you want to just get a drink or you want to just step out of the room and say nothing. You just had a good two song dancing moment and your adrenaline's pumping and you want to go sit in that. There's so many reasons for a dance floor getting small. All right. All right. Well, talk about dance floors. Let's talk a little bit about the work you put in in New York, 2000s, from APT to Santos. Mm -hmm. Talk us a little bit about that experience and just the nightlife then in New York City. <laughs> I mean, I've been chasing New York my entire life. You know, from the time I knew what a throw up was from the first time I saw somebody do a head spin from the first time I saw a DJ making a room of people dance. I've always wanted to be in New York. I've always wanted to be in New York. So when I became a man and started making my own decisions about what I'm doing with my life, it became part of that became part of my plans is that I am going to have a legitimate working knowledge of the club scene, the players in the scene, the dance community, the players in that community, and where I can go to learn some shit that I don't know. So by the time DJ Language and Bobito brought my name to the good people at APT, I had been running that play. Mm. Rinse and repeat. I'm not, it's not the like, yo, I've been in New York, boo, boo, boo. It's not that. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying it how it's supposed to be fucking said. I've been running that play mm. on rinse and repeat. Nigga, I don't know if it's a flea flicker. I don't know if it's a fucking <laughs> UCLA offense. Triangle offense, I don't know. 
but I got comfortable in every position in that play. And New York, those communities began to recognize me simply because I was showing up and I obviously wasn't from around the way. Right. Talk about the originals. Talk about the originals, all my favorites. Talk about that collaboration, that effort, that energy. It's so much. I, I'm a, I want to get to the originals, but I want to I want to I want to finish finish this this answer because it le- it's a great doorway into to your point. By the time APT came around, I was DJing four nights a week for the previous six years, seven years, like in a booth in front of some room of people four nights a week, sometimes two cities a week. Mm-hmm. You know, like basketball. Yeah. You play so much ball certain one summer. Every time you go to this park, if you step over half court on the right side of the court, they're trying to get you to rock because they know mm-hmm. that when you let that thing go, it's butter. Whatever. You had that you muscle memory even, going. You might not even start in the regular season. You might not even be on mm-hmm. the fucking basketball team. But in the park, niggas get you to rock. Right? <laughs> I was in that space as DJ at the time that the APT opportunity came my way. And crazy. I did that place for 300 bucks a week for a year. Mm drive it every week to and from Philadelphia. And at the end of the year, I was like, hey, you know, I become friends with the bartenders. I know what the bar's ringing. How about a conversation about a bar percentage? Mm-hmm. They're like, mm, no. But if you want to charge a cover, you can have it all. I was like, all? Reggie? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Scooby Doo face, like, Ooh. <laughs> right, 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 right. Ooh. and that is the impetus of us, the rubber beginning to hit the road for me in New York. Um, because now it wasn't, I wasn't chasing New York anymore. Now I'm, I'm in, I'm in the, mi- I'm in the mix. Simply because now, all of a sudden. Not all of a sudden. I mean, people have been paying to come to venues and events, whatever, long before me and whatever. It's part of the fabric. But this particular moment was like, oh, shit. (laughs) You know, all that, everything that you just counted is ours? (laughs) Oh, oh, (laughs) you know what I'm saying? That shit put a battery in my back. Exactly. Cannabis got better. Cannabis got better. <laughs> you know what I mean? No yeah, more yeah, seeds, yeah. nigga. No stems. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> My shit ain't popping no more. But, you know what I mean? But the way you style. talk about it, hmm? the way you talk about it today and reflect on it, hmm. were you in it in the present? Were, were, did you feel it? Okay, okay. Absolutely. I created a model that a lot of people have bitten since their first time they've seen it. Hmm. Yes, sir. 100%. I believe that I've set a tone that's indelible Mm. because that tone is rooted in intent and hard work. And the God-given talent part of it is tertiary, maybe even fourth or fifth place. Mamba rules. (laughs) Been Been in the gym for five hours before you even get out the fucking bed. Right. Don't make me better than you. Definitely says I work harder than you, though. Facts. We all know hard work pays off. So I'll see you at the fucking finish line. And I think that with regard to disregard for constructs and willingness to uh, push the envelope in terms of not just spoon feeding people things that they're familiar with, I think that, you know, <clears throat> put a battery in a lot of people's back. Right, right. I'm, I'm a 
feel very confident saying that. As well, you should, as one, the original member. You should. You designed. The originals. Yeah, you designed your lifestyle. Mm hmm. And that's where put you me are in a today. position to become friends with people like Stretch Armstrong and Clark Kent and D Nice and Tony Touch because I made myself impossible to ignore at a point. And when we became friends and came into contact with each other, it was, it was automatic. It was as if we had known each other our whole lives because there was a similar belief in right. diligence and intent at base. Forget about the paparazzi shit. Fuck all that. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? No, absolutely. If it was absolutely. a celebrity friend conversation, it would be a whole different chamber, right? But we're but talking not, about a brotherhood. You know, we're talking about dudes that's, yeah, slap dog shit out of anybody for any of them. Absolutely. I ain't even a slap dog shit out you. <laughs> I'm not even wired that way. You know what I mean? But, but you could be if you needed to be, right? <laughs> if, if it was for my brothers and they was under pressure, I would, those are the type of people that I would put myself in that space for. Activated, that's, definitely. That's more, that's more the point. So, yeah, man, you know, what a blessing to even know these guys and have them consider me a friend. And then, yeah, it's, 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 I haven't had very many big group relationships since basketball, mm. where you are just like a team and niggas work together for a long time and they like each other and it's good chemistry. And any of us could be egotistical at the drop of a dime, so there's no ego in the space. Take me to date. Bring me up to date to Dante's Hi-Fi. Talk about the vision here. Talk about why Miami. Uh, I think in some ways, a better question is, not a better question, but another way to look at it is to ask Miami, why me? You know? I'm not trying to present like a aha touche, but <laughs> no, that's, no, that's definitely kind of what it is, though. You know what I mean? Um, and I've been, I've been a two city parent for the better part of the last two years and change. Anyway, so for the last few years, when you've seen me, whoops, when you've seen me online with my son, that's uh, interstate parenting. Right. So, Dante's aside, I got I've had good legs in Miami as an artist for years, and my son is there, so I'm there with a whole different intent already. And the Dante's opportunity came my way last year through my partners, who I've already had working relationships with as an artist for years done things with Arturo Nunez at Nike when he was at Nike in the 90s yeah he opened the door to a bunch of opportunities for me there I've been working with Sven and Allen and 305 Concepts and Koyo and all of their various franchises right for years and I get a call like what do you think about running a vinyl bar. And I was like, what are you talking about, Willis? <laughs> <laughs> because that's what I said when I first heard of it. I was like, serious? In Miami? Mm -hmm. Serious? Like, it was such a gem to even hear they the concept being Japan. presented down here. They took some trips to Japan and some other American vinyl bars and we're inspired to create one. And I ended up, there was, I believe there was a few people that they were talking to about the opportunity. And I think our conversation just went the way they wanted it to go. I didn't know how it was supposed to go. I was just feeling, right. feeling the opportunity, but definitely took it serious 
and it's a two for one. You know, I'm stealing. <laughs> I, I give him the same zip code as my kid again. It's like Absolutely. a billion dollars. Absolutely. You talk about the importance of you talk about the importance of listening to music and you give so much history when you break records there. Talk about mm -hmm. the education component and how critical that is for you when your audience and your engagement, when you're spinning, when you're not spinning, when you're accompanying mm -hmm. other DJs and complimenting their work. Talk about that education component that Hi-Fi offers to the audience. Um, one of the great things about having an opportunity like this is that you get to you get to get into process. I think that whether you're a professional DJ or whether you buy MP3s off of Juno or whatever, anywhere in the, in the spectrum, you have a process about how you deal with music. It's universal. Everybody has it. You might not see it that way because music don't lead your life. But actually, music does lead your life. <laughs> Right? No matter where you're at. So we open up the floor to level the playing field with that state of mind. Everybody here has a process when it comes to music. Let me tell you a little something about this. That person that loves music and has got a crazy record collection or a crazy music collection or whatever, they go home inspired because they don't feel crazy no more the shit that they've been obsessing about quietly is actually as dope as they thought it was mm -hmm. not even necessarily that i'm educating you it's more i'm agitating you mm. you know what i'm saying sneaking the vegetables in the mashed potatoes <laughs> right <laughs> you know what i'm saying so, so unlocking that something they've already had yeah. Uh, Hi-fi sound, lo-fi approach. So, so speaking of that, what is what is the most important thing for you or the thing that you hope the listener takes with them after hearing you spin? That they had a good time. They found the palette of music, something that they enjoyed standing on and moving through and either coping with or appreciating and they are on the appreciative side of the way i put it together hopefully i'll be back the next time i'm there with two friends and if they come back with those two friends I remember the way you gave me a pound last week after I played that song that you love that you hadn't heard in so long that you already knew you just <laughs> hadn't heard it in so long and you heard it on this beautiful sound system. See what I'm saying? I'm not educating right. you in that in that analogy, right? In that instance, right? right? So now the playing field is level. Everybody got room. It's room for everybody, and up and down the scale when you go to see an artist or hear a DJ you don't necessarily get to hear experience their inside voice true you true. get some beautiful stuff from the way they talk to themselves and the way they flip their process that stands but you don't get you get zero inside voice It's, and that's where some education can exist. Is it? I'm not going to let you give me that. You understand? You see me pushing that. Yeah. Ball, I see. Right. I see you doing. I definitely see you doing that. And I, you really unlock great memories that we already have inside. And the music helps you to jar that memory and it brings it back to that moment for you. And you yeah. slide so, in history. You're. Your storytelling and your history of the encounters when you heard when you first heard this or how it made you feel is what feels like. You could like get up there and do the same thing with your music collection and rock people. Ah. 
Yeah. You I'm know just shit might. about certain <laughs> artists and certain things that are whatever culturally close to you or some shit you've gravitated to. Right. And you could say some shit that 99% of the people in that space had no fucking idea, idea. that that was a fact. That's, the field is yeah. level. Yeah. But, but that's what I want. We're not going to let you push that push that all the way off, though, because I still will argue. <laughs> <laughs> I still will argue that is an educational process. And just because other people can engage in it as well, that actually maybe supports the argument that it's an educational process. It's a two way street. But there is something about managing that crowd, managing those emotions as they walk into the door that takes practice. Right. <laughs> Yeah, you said it, man. It's a two-way street. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. If ain't nobody answering me, I'm talking to my fucking self. It's cool. It's not zero sum. It's not like if I'm talking to myself is a problem. I'm not going to make a dumbass point talking to myself. I'm not going to make a dumbass point talking to you. So why would I be dumb to myself? So me talking alone is not a problem. It's just people kind of roboting around their sensibilities when it comes to music because the lure of the pop world is a whole different thing than what we're talking about. You know, I know, I know educated black women and call, call her a bitch in the street. She'll punch her in the teeth. Let one of these mumble mouth niggas call her a bitch and talk about all the shit he's going to do to her. And, she got the butt cheeks bubbling. Same girl. I judge her. I have a conversation with the girl. She, could, I could be like Jay Z or not. She could be like, mm, Jay Z. I don't want to take an encyclopedia to the club. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> Ill point. Interesting debate. Slide and skip. Right. That's a. That's some shit. Right. So I didn't see that before she said that shit. Two way street. That was her. Res that was her response to me, like asking her the question about. Like, you really did. You be bugging out when the ratchet shit come on. <laughs> but like, I, I know you. I rock with you. Like, I know you. <laughs> it, it, just, it doesn't. I don't get it. And she be like, nigga. I want to take a fucking thesaurus to the club, nigga. Yeah. I was like, oh, shit. You want to let loose ah, and not I think. Even, yeah. I, I want, you know, think. that's a different kind of loose to me. Right. Right. Absolutely. So one of these things that I, I've always, I first came really into your music and what you were doing with the whole Afrobeat and Fela movement and sort of what I would say, the rediscovery, that period. And, uh, you know, a lot of people was dealing with Fela before that, obviously. Um, but just that type of, I felt like it, 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 it grew into a, a arena where it became a thing. Mm -hmm. Did you ever see it would be, Afrobeat will be, you know, foresee what it is today. Like it's, it's, it's all over the world. It's, it's now moved into Justin Bieber doing songs with <laughs> WizKid, you know? Yeah, man. I mean, yeah, of course. I definitely saw it. Once I saw it, I'm not the first motherfucker to see it. I'll keep that a buck just the same. But when I saw it, I was like, oh, shit. Oh, <laughs> you know, it was that for me. My introduction, my true personal introduction to Fela's music was like a clean left hook to the fucking temple. Donk. Birds floating around your head. Like, the fuck was that? <laughs> you know what I mean? It was really that for me. Like, at that space of visceral like what is this nigga saying this ain't patois mm. the fuck is this <laughs> you know what I mean this is me talking to myself the fuck is what 
What do you say about the government? Holy <laughs> shit. Who is? Oh my God. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a motherfucking minute. How come I? Why don't I know? Now I'm tight. Full band. Oh, no, let's Full do this shit. Now I'm pissed <laughs> yeah, off. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. why the fuck don't I know? Why don't I have a working vocabulary for this yet? Yeah, I've heard of Fela. Yeah, I've heard pieces and bits of these songs over the years. I'm a fucking music freak. Yes, absolutely. But my first experience with it, myself, it flipped everything. It flipped everything for me. I was like, this is the fucking James Brown of Africa. Holy shit. Ooh, and this nigga got a political agenda? Son of a bitch. (laughs) You know? I was like, fuck. And that's kind of the the why I went after his catalog so aggressively, like mm-hmm. from ninety two, between ninety two and ninety five. Yeah. I was just bat shit crazy going after African music, yeah. Af- particularly African funk music, yeah. African soul music, you know. Mm-hmm. Just digging. I was just going for it. And the more I got, the more I played. And fast forward to 2000, 2001. Trevor Schumacher is about to do the Black President exhibit at the New Museum. Mm -hmm. Debbie Seeley is managing Wumi. You may know Wumi as the woman with the long hair dancing in the Soul to Soul mm-hmm. Back to Life video. You probably know her music now as well. A Wumi Olaya. Mm-hmm. Um, and I have this reputation as the dude that plays all this Fela Akuti music. And we come together and decide to create an event that will explain to people who Fela Kuti is and why he's the black president. And that is the birth of Jumpin' Funk. Right, mm. right, right, right. right. <laughs> Absolutely. Salute. Uh, you said uh, political music. That's an understatement, right? <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah. So, to we got Dante's high five. What's next for Rich Medina besides Dante's high five, or is that the focus right now? Yeah, man. I, you know, Dante's is the focus. Um, wrapping my head around the fact that I just got a Pew Fellowship, and man. the best way to really. manage my relationship with the pew mm. and make it everything that it's supposed to be so yeah it's a lot of there's a lot of focus right now it's kind of always a lot of focus but yeah i mean the focus is just land a plane on the shit you start <laughs> you know what i mean right. i'm keeping my shit real two plus two right. so right. keep it simple land a fucking plane let me ask you a question about the pew fellowship is there a certain body of work they they expect you to work on? What is the obligation there? What is sort of the framework for the fellowship? Um, The Pew Fellowship is a no-strings-attached grant. Um, You have to hand in a report about how you utilize the grant to your advantage, but there's no uh, material work obligation. Okay. People do it quite often. It's a fantastic gesture. And some people's art is more tied to Pew and institutions like the Pew. You know, for me, it's my first engagement at that tier. But I'm also friends with Sanford Biggers, who owns that world. You know what I'm saying? So Beautiful. Yeah. The rookie in the gym. You know, 
I got drafted because I can fight. I'm about to see, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's really that. I'm not saying I'm going in there and beating niggas up. I'm saying I'm giving you a, a real window. Rookie in the league. I might be starting, but I still got to carry bags. Absolutely. All that shit. Yeah. <laughs> all that shit is happening. Yeah, right. The same shit. Yeah. All the relativity, all the stuff that we've tied together in, the, in this conversation. Like, it's not, it's not theoretical. It's all happening. So it's good to be in a new space and trying to figure out what's next. You know, 2022 is a new year. It's kind of cool what we did. Nice, nice, mm -hmm. thanks. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it don't stop. That's a lot of cool shit. Yeah. Like, let's make some more cool shit. You know? Continue the process, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. So All season long, we've been asking each of our guests, what does free the culture mean to you? Rich Medina, finish that for me. What does free the culture mean to you? Free the culture means to present more than a zero-sum conversation about achievement and to present people with a real opportunity to apply themselves outside of colonial constructs. Because the culture is choked off by colonialism. You know, every lobby, every argument, every debate that we put on the table is choked off by the strength of colonialism, by the legal and material strength of colonialism. You know, so freeing the culture is a big ask. <laughs> That's why we ask. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, it's a big ask. You know, I might need to show up. I might need to do part two for that. Like, just about that. <laughs> you know? Right. Oh, no. That's a lot. Absolutely. It's definitely a lot, but that's why we ask. We really, really appreciate you sitting down and talking with us, you know, sharing the wisdom. Two way street, right? Education is a, is a yeah, two way man. street. So we appreciate that. Word. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Lynn, any last words? It's truly a pleasure. It's been a journey today. It's definitely been a journey. Oh, nice. Listening to your story. Yeah, sharing your energy. We appreciate you so much. Thank you, Rich. Cool. I enjoyed myself too, man. It was great talking to you guys. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And that's a wrap, guys. This is Leaf Style. No longer a soap culture. <whistles> a Leaf Style. <laughs>